Dear Repulso Industry Friends, welcome to the episode number 7 of Turn In With The Expert. In this episode, we discuss with Christophe Casabin about the history of the IBDV isolations and publications, as well the evolution of the strains. So, stay tuned with the experts and know all about controlling Bumbor disease. Enjoy. So, we are back here from our headquarters in Libourne, France, to another topic to be discussed with Christophe Casabin, our poultry scientific director. And today we are going to discuss about the history of the Bumbor isolations and publications and the evolution of the strains. So, good morning. How are you today, Christophe? Morning, Marco. I'm fine. How are you? Good, good. So, um, going to, to our talk from today, from my point of view, one, one of the most important points to control any kind of disease is to understand its dynamic. And of course, it's not different for the Bumbor disease control. Okay? Um, so I would like to, to, to talk to you today about the history and evolution of this Bumbor challenge, this IBD virus. Uh, so to start, can you briefly describe to us the history of the Bumbor disease since it was first diagnostic in Delaware in 1957? So, yeah, it's a quite an, uh, interesting history, which started by a mistake, actually, since these, the first uh, scientists who were called in uh, Goomboro town, it's a very small town in Delaware State, in the United States, they were uh, called for, uh, to attend a, uh, an outbreak which was quite contagious, so spreading quite fast. So that was a, a concept of, of infectious agent behind. But what they saw upon, upon a necropsy was first kidney lesions. So uh, quite typical kidney lesions with a lot of uh, white infiltrates. And they first called it avian nephrosis. Obviously, the first idea they had in mind was a kind of infectious bronchitis virus that was behind that. And it took several years, actually, to find out that it was not infectious bronchitis virus at all, but a new virus, or let's say a newly discovered virus, because, of course, at that time, there was some uh, limited uh, laboratory uh, equipment and, and tests available to rule out different options until uh, identifying a new virus that was eventually called infectious brussel disease virus or Gumboro virus as a tribute to this very first detection in uh, Gumboro town. Okay, you already described it a little bit, and, but it's important to know how the diagnostic methods in the labs was important to understand the Gumboro challenge, how they contributed to an understanding of the disease. Yes, of course. And uh, again, we have to, to keep in mind that in the uh, 60s or, or 70s, we, have to, we had to deal with various isolation methods in embryonated eggs, which was quite cumbersome, quite difficult to, to be done, uh, and subject to contamination, of course, until moving to some, let's say, uh, agar gel precipitation methods to, to characterize or to diagnose the, the disease. And quickly afterwards, let's say in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the different serology uh, kits were put on the, on the market and they also helped dramatically to, to identify the, the presence of the, of the disease. And ultimately, all of the uh, biological uh, molecular tools that are so familiar to us today, namely the PCR, methods, as well as some uh, new uh, advanced tools like sequencing, which are today our daily routine, uh, help tremendously to uh, further identify and characterize this virus. So, as you are at first for many years in SIVA, can you explain to us as well how SIVA contributed to understand this virus circulation of the world and the challenge? What was the SIVA contribution? So, we had a uh, partnership with the uh, one of the OIE reference laboratories for Gumboro disease, which is uh, located in France, actually. Uh, this is the uh, ANSES uh, Proofragant. 
Uh, and we, we had at that time, I mean, from 1999, so most of the people were perhaps not born at that time or, or very, very young. Uh, we had a partnership with this lab in order to collect some, uh, some uh, bursa samples from many places around the world and that were shipped to this, uh, to this laboratory uh, within the framework of OIE uh, delegates. And in Ploufragan, they had a specific test which was able to identify the virus and characterize whether it was of the classical type or of the very virulent type, which was uh, uh, booming, I would say, around the world. And thanks to this partnership, we were, we were very proud that ANSES and SIVA were the very first ones to describe uh, and, and identify and describe the presence of very virulent form of Gomorrah disease virus in Brazil first, and later on in all of the uh, South American uh, countries. Uh, this one of the key findings of this survey, uh, but there were all obviously other uh, very interesting findings from different places around the, the world in terms of uh, Gomorrah virus characterization. Okay, and in the last years, uh, some other strains named it as variant has been isolated around the world. The first point I would like to understand, what's really a variant? What's the concept of a variant? So the concept of a variant comes from the, the finding that some Gomorrah viruses were able to escape from the passive immunity that is provided by the maternally derived antibodies. In other words, <coughs> these antibodies are quite specific and quite specific to the kill vaccine that has been administered to the breeders. And there were descriptions of field viruses which were able to infect birds despite they were provided with maternally derived antibodies. So that's why came this concept of variant strains. We have to know that today with the more and more sophisticated diagnostic tools, we are able to go very deeply into the, the fine characterization of, of a, a genome of a given virus. And we are nowadays, I would say, logically able to identify new viruses slightly different from the previous ones. And indeed, there is currently a new classification which is proposed which is rather talking in terms of genogroups rather than variants versus classical. So it's a very dynamic process. And the, uh, again, the molecular tools are currently able to uh, characterize very, very deeply the, the, the nature or the, the makeup of different uh, virus strains. Something important for the people and the production sites are these variants important? Can they impact the production? So these variants are called variants because of their antigenic makeup or genetic makeup. In the same time, strains, regardless they are variants, classical, different genogroups, are provided with different virulence capabilities, different pathogenicity, capabilities. So that's why in terms of clinical outcome, customers can face different types of uh, manifestations. However, what is common for all of them is the immunosuppressive ability that have these viruses upon your, your, uh, your flock. So regardless the strain, I would say, regardless the general group, they are to some extent inducing some losses into your, uh, your figures, into your produ production performances, because they are immunosuppressive. And how do you see the evolution of these strains along the years? So, we know now that this virus is able to mutate, probably to a lesser extent than infectious bronchitis or avian influenza viruses. However, it does. And again, the, the more sophisticated molecular tools we have, the more likely we are to 
discover and to describe strains which are a little bit different than the previously described ones. So we do observe currently some publications describing new types of gomboroviruses that are called reassortants or, or of different genogroups whatsoever. So again, I rather think that this evolution is more related to our capabilities to better and better diagnose and characterize the, the virus rather than a kind of speeding up of mutation capabilities of this virus compared to 20 years ago. Christophe, I know that you follow really closely several research teams around the world and have communication with them. Uh, so regarding boom borne disease studies, what in the last year uh, kept your attention that you, you find uh, in person? So definitely there are few scientific groups that are working on this issue around the, the world, uh, in the United States, as well as in Europe, as well as in, in Asia. And what drew my attention is two things. The uh, description of new strains, slightly different than the previously described ones. And again, this is due to the fact that we are now capable to really uh, deeply investigate the, the uh, genetic and antigenic makeup of these, uh, of these strains. So there are more and more publications about these, uh, let's say, new strains. And there are also new publications about finding ways to classify strains in a more accurate way. So there have been already a couple of proposals that have been issued by some uh, US teams. I, I think about the team of uh, Dr. Daryl Jackwood, for instance, as well as other teams like the team of uh, 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 Rafikul Islam in, in Bangladesh, to, together with a French team of, of ANSES Proufragan, who are constantly trying to fine-tune the uh, classification of the virus into different genetic groups. Just to give you an example, until recently, it was common to uh, look only at one small piece of the virus, namely the hypervariable portion of the virus protein number two, uh, VP2. And there is today a proposal to look not only at the entire VP2 uh, sequence, but also to look at the second portion of the uh, nucleic acid, which is uh, containing the VP1 protein. So, as you can see, it's a kind of dynamic process among expert teams around the world to find the most accurate approach for a better classification of the various strains around the world. So, looking to the future, based on the history, on the evolution of the boom strains, strains, what, what can we expect of evolution of these strains in the future? So, what we, are, uh, what we have to, to expect is uh, probably to be able to, again, better identify these strains and also from the prevention standpoint to adopt our strategies. I would rather uh, uh, first sp uh, split my, my talk in two, two parts. In terms of passive immunity, we'll have probably to rethink our approach towards the uh, breeder vaccination program in order to match as closely as possible to the circulating strain in the progeny houses, in order to provide with this progeny the best suitable uh, passive immunity to fight early against this uh, possible infection. There is another aspect in the immunization of this progeny to deal with this ever-changing population of virus strains in the field is probably to look for some options for uh, perhaps a quicker onset of immunity, a faster onset of immunity, a more homogeneous within the, the flock, because again, it's a constant race between the vaccine strain and the field strain, and we want to reduce as much as possible the opportunities for the field strain to infect our flocks. And to close, 
regarding the studies that are ongoing around the world, what's going to be released in the near future that's really interesting? So I would say that probably in the near future, we're gonna uh, see a harmonization into the classification of the different strains uh, around the world. And that's very much needed, I would say, because today there is a kind of confusion uh, between the, the antigenic makeup and the pathogenic uh, power, pathogenic uh, ability. So there is definitely a need for such type of, of uh, clarification, I would say. Another uh, area of improvement is probably to better understand whether there is some cross protection, cross neutralization among the different general groups that are going to be described around the world. In other words, that we don't need probably to, to put too many strains into a kill vaccine for breeders, since some of them may probably do the job uh, in front of other, other uh, viruses. And as I mentioned, there is a constant uh, work in progress among vaccine companies to propose to the market some new developments, some uh, new generation of, uh, of vaccines that will be able to, uh, to improve the, the, uh, the effect and the, uh, the uh, customer uh, improvements, customer benefits on the long term. With that, we close one more episode and I would like to thank a lot, Christophe, to share your expertise with us and to contribute with the poultry production. No way, thank you. Thank you for watching this episode. And do not hesitate to give us your feedback by commenting down below in the comment section. Goodbye, stay safe.